Manik is um, a well-known expert on several topics, actually, in computer vision. He has now started doing more machine learning, but he must not forget his good old days. He, he has uh, done great work in texture recognition and uh, kind of clipped the tail of my dear advisor, Jitendra, a little bit, showing that um, texture, texture recognition can be done in a much simpler way than, 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 than was thought before. He has uh, done some uh, um, very impressive work on, uh, on the side of uh, object recognition. Um, and um, uh, Manik is also um, a man of very impeccable taste, especially a taste of, of, of places. He has, uh, um, he has been to some of the best places on earth. He has been uh, studying in Oxford under Andrew Zisserman. He has also been to Berkeley, working with uh, David Forsyth and also doing a little uh, a postdoc at MSRI in Berkeley on the beautiful hill. And then he went to the best place uh, again in India, the, this, uh, this lab, the Microsoft Research Office in Bangalore. Uh, and he's also an adjunct professor at IIT Delhi, right? Yeah. And, um, and so, so one thing, we share, we, we share many things in common with, with Manik. I'm also a man of mostly impeccable taste because I have also <laughs> been to Oxford and Berkeley uh, and also worked with uh, Andrew. Uh, but uh, we're, we're both don't really see very well. And so I feel like this, this maybe is kind of a, also leaks into our research. But the main difference is that I'm just, everything's kind of blurry for me, so I'm just, oh, you know, everywhere. Manik is very good at, at seeing Foveal vision, focusing on a particular problem and really figuring out exactly how it works. It's very, very precise and, and focused, which is really what you want from a, from a great scientist. So with that, please, Manik, go ahead. Um, before I get on to my talk, I thought I'd just do a very quick, um, just a very quick five-minute spotlight, two-minute spotlight on some machine learning stuff that might actually be, be useful for vision. This is a paper that appeared in NIPS uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the title is Multiple Kernel Learning and the SMO Algorithm. I wonder why there isn't a large scale max margin, blah. Uh, and it's done by Vichy, joint work with Vishy and his students at Purdue. So just a quick, quick two minute thing with this and then we'll move on to the, uh, the main image search talk. Okay. So John Platt's famous SMO algorithm is one of the most effective ways of uh, of optimizing or learning a nonlinear SVM. So it really scales well to large problems, it's versatile, it's simple, and the code is easy to implement and modify. So the take home message of our work is that you can take something like uh, large scale multiple learning problems, and now you can train it using SMO. And the code is available from my webpage, and you can go and give it a shot for yourselves and try it out and just play with it on your own laptops. So very quickly, what is multiple kernel learning? Okay, the problem in the objective in MKL, or multiple kernel learning, is to jointly learn both kernel and SVM parameters. And in particular, the kernel, the kernel that we're going to learn, is learned to be a linear combination of given base kernels. So somebody gives, gives us feature vectors uh, and kernels defined on top of them. And we weight them. We have to learn these weights D, and these are supposed to be non-negative. Okay? So that's the setting in, uh, in MKL. And training using SMO has been a kind of holy grail in MKL for a long time. Francis Bach gave it a shot in about 2004, and lots of other people have tried it as well. But the main reason it hasn't worked is because we've insisted on putting a L1 regularizer on the kernel weights to uh, get sparse solutions. So the reason that becomes problematic is that when you look at the MKL dual, you'll either end up in a situation where you get quadratic inequality constraints in the dual variables alpha, and this is something that is very difficult to handle using gradient methods because the projection back into the feasible side becomes very difficult. And the alternative is, so, so this is the feasible set that you see over here, and projecting back into the set becomes very expensive. The alternative is you can try and eliminate these constraints and move them back into the objective, but then your objective becomes non-differentiable. So if you look at this simple toy example, you have these three regions where the max, where different uh, kernels are going to be max over, and on the boundaries you have uh, these functions aren't differentiable. So you can't apply gradient descent. You can't do techniques like SMO over here. Okay? So what we realized was, if you make a very, very, very small relaxation, and you now relax the regularizer to being the one norm, you relax it to any p norm which is strictly greater than one, and for that matter, you could use any, well, not any, but lots of Bregman divergences as well, 
it turns out that the MQL dual becomes very nice and simple. So you get an objective which is uh, completely smooth. Uh, and you can see it's the same kind of form, but now it's smooth. You don't have a max term. And the constraints are also very simple. So you have a box constraint and a simple inequality constraint, sorry, linear e equality constraint. And now you can just go ahead and apply SMO. Okay? And the results are very, very, very encouraging. So in terms of the scale of problems we can tackle, we can now train on about 50,000 points with 50 kernels in about half an hour on very standard hard hardware. And if you take a, another benchmark data set that's used on this problem, like Sonar, for example, then we can train on 100,000 kernels in seven minutes if you can pre-compute the kernels, and in a, about 30 minutes if you have to compute them on the fly. And this is like orders of magnitude better than the state of the art. So people have been playing with about 1,000 kernels on Sonar so far. Okay? And so even if you come down to that level when, when it's not really that difficult, then you can see as compared to the state of the art, we can be about an order of magnitude faster even on these very small problems. And you can see that by setting like different values of P, we can actually learn sparse solutions. So if you have 800 kernels, you set P to be close to one, you get, you get back something that has only 900 kernels selected. So you can use it for all the stuff that you had been doing previously, but now like train on really large problems. So the code is available on my website. If you have applications in vision or other fields where you think, learning the kernel in an SVM might be useful, then yeah, just give it a shot, download the code, play with it, send me feedback. Okay, so that was the five minute spotlight. Any quick questions on that before I move on? Subgradient, this is different. Yeah, so there, there have been cutting plane methods for this, and this Shogun thingy is a cutting plane method. That's a cutting plane method. So this is like orders of magnitude faster than cutting planes. Yeah, uh, anything else? Okay, so do give the code a shot. Just download it off my web page and play with it. And uh, in terms of number of kernels selected or classification performance, yeah, they're, they're pretty similar. In fact, you get, sometimes get better results with non-sparse solutions. Depends on what your problems are, right? In Vision, if you have 10 kernels and these have all been like engineered very well, there's no reason for sparsity. You want to use all of them because all of them will contribute. If you're in a different setting where you have 100,000, so like Mike Jordan has all these problems in bioinformatics where you have all these features and most of them are noise, and you want to throw those away. And then you want sparsity, but then the number of features goes up. So now when you're in the 100,000 feature regime, now you can use this code to do your feature selection. Uh, and, and this can handle nonlinear feature selection. It's one of the few, few methods that can. So in about 50,000 training points, 50 kernels we can handle in 30 minutes. This is a relatively easy problem. If you take a really hard problem, which is not really li by, like linearly separable, then uh, so like I'm talking about the adult data set, which is about 32,000 points, we take about two hours on that, on standard hardware. If you look at this, this was actually a parallel implementation, multi-cores, lots of fancy stuff going in. Of course, the, the difficulty of the problem always, yeah, I mean, if you give me a problem which, which you, I can't solve, right, it's not linearly separable, you can't expect me to do a good job very quickly. So, of course, it depends on the complexity of the problem, yes. Cool. Let's quickly shift to the main talk, which is uh, query-dependent image re-ranking using click data. And this is joint work with Vidit, Vidit Jain from Yahoo, who's probably here somewhere, sitting in the back. Okay, so our objective over here is to improve the quality of image search engines, okay? And so to motivate uh, that bit, let's actually see how well image search engines perform at tail queries. So tail queries are queries that are not asked very frequently. The head queries, which are celebrities and, and porn, of course, uh, everyone nails by hand, right? So the real measure of a search engine is how well you do on the queries that are infrequently asked. And that's the focus of this talk, okay? So, hello? Oh, okay. Cool. So I went and cooked up this tail query and I went to Yahoo and I asked the Yahoo search engine, so what do you think about top computer vision researchers? Okay. And these are the five results I got back from Yahoo before Yahoo was Bing. Okay. So if these are the five people that we think are responsible for directing the shape of computer vision research, no wonder image search is where it is today. <laughs> then I went to Bing. And I asked again, top computer vision researchers, these results are slightly better. Because even though we don't have AZ's photo over here, at least we have a snapshot of his brain. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, there's Google. 
And Google's results are much, much, much worse. Okay? Because not only do we not have a picture of AZ, even his brain seems to have gone away. Right? Um, no, but actually these results are much better. If you squint really hard, you'll see the most fearsome David Forsyth in there. And uh, of course, they have to index the Stanford faculty, so there's Fei Fei and stuff, right? So, so Google's results are better, slightly, much better. But let's abstract the problem out for a minute, right? So what we're interested in doing is taking a baseline ranking, which could have been um, generated by any of these image search engines, and know that this baseline ranking could be really bad, right? So the results at the top could be really pathetic. The results in the middle could be iffy. And our perfect matches are languishing so far down the bottom that we can't even see them. Okay? So that's our baseline ranking algorithm. And what we now want to do is we want to re-rank this list so that the set of perfect matches bubbles up to the top to replace these, right? And so, of course, if you do this for this uh, Wait for the next one. It's the truth. <laughs> it's not an illustration, <laughs> right? So this is, of course, when you do that, this is what you should get. OK? <laughs> uh, but of course, even our algorithm is not perfect. And when we are make mistakes, we're going to highlight that by a red rectangle, like around this reclining gentleman over here. OK? So that's the goal. You are given a baseline ranking. We want to re-rank it so that the re-ranked results are significantly better. OK? That's the essential goal. And what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to focus on three main limitations of keyword-based image search. So internet style, when you go to Google or Bing, just type in a couple of keywords and get back results, right? So the three main limitations are that if you look at most search engines, they do not focus on image content. They're just trying to retrieve things based on the basis of, like on text, the text behind the web page and, and surrounding the image, et cetera, right? So that's one of the most severe limitations that they face. And another thing is that we learn a single prediction model for all handling all types of queries within a vertical. So forget what vertical is. It's just like a, 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 a group of queries. But within that, we use a single ranker. We don't adapt our uh, prediction model or our learned parameters to the particular query at hand. Okay? So that's the second issue that I would like to address. And the third is, and this is really challenging because people in vision don't talk about this either, uh, like in the main vision community, is, is, is the focus of user intent. Okay? So often when we ask a query, the, the, it's very ambiguous. So keywords form a very impoverished means of communication between a user and a search engine. And so it's often very ambiguous as to what the user really means and what are good results for that query. So that's something that I would also like to tackle in this talk. And the way I'm going to do it is by using uh, or leveraging user click data. So whenever any of you go and asks a query uh, at Google or Bing or uh, Yahoo or Ask or whatever, what we do is we log, we log lots of information about you, actually. So we log what query you asked, what images were shown in response to that query, what you clicked on, which pages you visited, how long you hovered your mouse over a certain image, and all that stuff. Okay? And I'm going to be using, in particular, the information about if you asked a particular query, what did you click on? That's user click data. Okay? So that's what I'm going to be using. And I'm going to show that by using uh, some kinds of fairly standard, straightforward learning methods where we're going to predict which images users are going to click on and re-rank on the basis of that, we can get huge performance in like, measure, metrics that measure search performance. So if you take something like NDCG, which I will improve, uh, like talk about later. I'll explain that in detail. It's a number between 0 and 1. Large, large values of NDCG are better. Right? We can get these really astonishing improvements of NDCG, like about 12% or so, just like using these very simple techniques. NDCG improvements generally come in about the 0.1% improvement range, if you look at papers in WWW and Wisdom, the top conferences in this field. And so like, whenever you suspect, see anything like this, you have to suspect. Either I'm on drugs or I can't see what I'm doing. Right? Both could be true. OK, so very quickly, let me just highlight what I meant by the three limitations that we have. Uh, and we return back to Andrew, right? So I have a picture of Andrew on my web page, right? But there's no surrounding text on it. OK, that could even be in your photo, personal photo collection. So none of our uh, image search engines actually goes and indexes this image. And so when I go and type in a query like Andrew Zissiman, I never get this image, right? So that is one of the limitations of text of just base, or like searching based on text. And you have the reverse problem with text as well, that if you actually do go and search for Andrew Zissiman on, the, on Google, you get all of these results. Okay? And none of them are correct apart from this one. 
And that's because the text on the web pages behind these is, hey, I'm a PhD student at Oxford, and I'm doing my PhD with Andrew Zissiman. Okay? So uh, these are all of his students, or some of his ex-students now. Okay? So this is one of the main problems with text, searching just based on text and ignoring image content. The second problem which I alluded to was that we're learning a single prediction model for all types of queries. Okay? Now, to illustrate why that's a bad idea, just take this simple example. Suppose we are learning a linear prediction model, right? So I'll extract some features from my document or my web page or my image, right? And to predict how it should be ranked, I just take, I just give it a weighted linear combination of features. So all these features I, I have some weights. I learn the weights. And then when I predict it, I get a real number and I s sort on the basis of that, right? So that's how I'm going to do ranking. Now in this model, suppose I have a feature which is, and all of us have this feature, which is the query does it match the image file name exactly or not? Okay. So it turns out that this feature is very good for celebrities. So if you actually look at images called tomcruise.jpg, they will very uh, often or almost, yeah, very often, almost all the time, turn out to be relevant to the query. They will all be images that you would want to display. Okay. On the other hand, if you look at place and location queries, you'll have things called delhi.jpg, which aren't really images of interest. Okay. Some tourists passing through Delhi, spending the one day over there, took the one photograph and called it delhi.jpg on his Flickr site or whatever. Okay? So in this case, this feature, whether the query matches the file name exactly is very good. You want to give it a large weight. In this case, it's not good. It's a kind of indifferent. So you don't want to give it a large weight. Right? But if you have a single prediction model, you can't hope to satisfy both. Okay? So you get into trouble because of that. Yeah, but it's a very it's a very good feature. I mean, uh, for actually recognizing celebrities, it, it it works very well. It works much better than face recognition would, uh, in in many circumstances. Okay? And so there are tons of features that you have. Okay. Uh, and the third problem is about user intent. Now this is really 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 hard. Okay. So to illustrate why why it's such a big problem, let me try and uh, tell you how we get. So when we, when we, how, how do we build an image search uh, a, a ranker, right? The way all of us do this is we go and look at our query logs, and then we go and sample the queries from these query logs, right? Some kind of stratified sampling. So you, we might say, look, okay, somebody asked night rain, somebody asked fracture, she who must be obeyed, right? So we just pick these up from the query log, and then we go and look at our, look at the web, uh, look at our uh, set of indexed images, and again sample some images from them. And then we go and give these query image pairs to experts to annotate. Okay? So the expert must say on a scale of one to five, one being not relevant and five being very relevant, whether the image is relevant to the query or not. Okay? And these experts are like, uh, it's exactly like Wikipedia, uh, sorry, Mechanical Turk or something like that. They're paid per, uh, per result. And so, so what they really want to do is get this done very quickly. Okay? So if you get a query like Night Train and you give it to experts, and uh, I mean, they're not exactly mechanical turkers, but I mean, they've, they've gone through a lot of training and stuff like that. But you give them queries like uh, the, the night train query, and you give them images like these, and almost all of them will say like images of trains at night are relevant, and images of these motorcycles are irrelevant. Okay? And then you're going to go and train your ranker by saying, this is my relevant set, this is my irrelevant set, I want to learn my weights W, and what's the best job I can do. The problem with this is that when you actually go and ask users, what were you searching for? All the users will say, we are actually interested in these motorcycles, because this is the night train model of the Harley Davidson brand. Okay? <laughs> Nobody's interested in generic images of trains at night. Why would they? You have the reverse problem as well. Okay? You give judges these images of broken bones for the query fracture. You also give them images of the movie. And they say both of these are relevant, both, both images of broken bones as well as the movie. It turns out less than 2% of users who actually ask the query fracture are looking for images of the movie. Had they wanted images of the movie, they would be looking for like asking fracture movie or movie fracture or some kind of variant there. 98% of the users actually want images of broken bones. And there's no way for an expert to know this, no matter how much of an expert they claim themselves to be. So when we're learning from this kind of annotated training data, we're actually learning with a lot of noise. And this can hurt us in many situations. Okay, so I'm going to address all of these three problems using user clicks. 
And the essential story is this, right? So if we go back to this example where you're not getting good results because you're ignoring visual content, if we could somehow infer what were the relevant images for a particular query, we could extract features from them. We could extract information. We could run a face detector, et cetera, for that particular uh, face recognizer for that, right? For this, again, if we knew what images or what documents were relevant to a query, we could learn a model specifically tailored to that particular query, right? We don't have to look. We can have different weights for this query and then different weights for that query because we are learning query-specific weights from the relevant images. And similarly over here, we could disambiguate the many meanings of a particular query. Okay. So this is what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to say that by leveraging click data, so the data that people about, like if I look at my logs for the last six months, see how often this query was asked, see what images were clicked on in response to that query, that will help me solve all three problems. Okay. Yeah. What? How can I do search without looking at the input? The whole goal is to personalize results for what you asked now. In fact, the whole goal of this would be: had I been had had Google and Microsoft and Yahoo been able to get enough training data and stuff, we would have wanted to build rankers for every query that could have been asked. Right? What's the ideal algorithm? The ideal algorithm is a guy sitting in this chess playing robot, which is when it looks at your query, produces the perfect result for you. No, but that's exactly the point, right? So if I can learn something per query, and I can learn this automatically, then this can adapt to very large scale problems that you can adapt to per query. It can also learn very quickly over time, right? So if the set of queries has changed 20 years from now, I can learn. Sorry? Sure. Yeah, but. You're you questioning the use of click data? No, no. So I'm saying for today's terms, it may be useful. Yes. Is this, is this the sort of the way we should be looking at problems? It's asking for a generic. Uh, this is a generic solution. What's yeah. not generic about it? Okay. I still don't understand. Maybe you should take this offline. Uh, where was I? Yeah. So the whole premise of this is clicks are somehow correlated with relevance. Okay. Clicked images in response to a query are correlated with relevant answers for that query. Now it turns out that this is not true for documents. Okay. People have tried this for web style, like document search before, and it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is the way the results are displayed. When you ask a query, you get a two-line snippet below the answer. So when you actually go and click on that link, or you're actually still in the exploratory phase. You're trying to see whether this uh, document really answers or meets my information needs or not. Then so often it doesn't. So then you backtrack and come back out again, right? So clicks with documents often don't correlate. But with images, what happens is when you do image search, you see a thumbnail of your result. So barring distractors and changes of intent, you know exactly what you're going to get when you see when you see on an image. So barring these uh, distractors, clicks are often very correlated to relevance. You know exactly what you'll get when you click on it. You get the whole thing. So it turns out for do, uh, images, we have a very high correlation between clicks and relevance. For videos, it's still not clear. Okay? So in videos, some people just show a single frame from a video, in which case you'll have the same problem. But then other people will do, when you do a mouse over, they'll play a 30 second clip. So depending on how representative that clip is, the clicks will be correlated or not. So this is still a bit of an open issue. Okay? So just to give you, so show you some like uh, anecdotal examples. Fracture, here are the images that were clicked on the most by users. Child drinking water, that's what you get. Uh, spring break, and you can see most of these are very correlated with the query that you've asked. Okay. So before I present our solution, let me give you a very naive way of leveraging clicks, which might seem very attractive when we start off, right? Well, my, 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 yeah. On the previous slide, yeah. 
So these these examples. These are the top clicked images in response to the query. How typical are the queries? Like the child drinking water is that is that a is that a high um, pop, a popular query? No, no. So the most popular queries are always porn and celebrities. Right. But these I'm are the. Yeah, so there's a so with image so like video has a very short tail. You'll have five categories in which almost all query, video queries can be fitted. Images, the tail is like very long. Okay, so what we are really going to this, in fact, I think has not is not that uh, frequent a query. But in terms of like deciding, like is it is it an important query? Yes, because the tail is what you really want to nail. The tail is how you're really going to compare Google and Bing tomorrow. Okay. But is it like the most popular thing that people are asking for? No. That's always celebrities. And is this a uh, publicly available data set? Or? Yeah. Uh, which data set? The so set of queries? Uh, no. You have to be working here to get our clicks or at Google to get Google's clicks. But people have simulated clicks in the lab. So people at Cornell, they just like ask people in the lab to, they put up their own website and say, oh, hey, please go, and then they collect their. So uh, I mean, academics do have, and of course, you you sign an NDA, you can get this data. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So here's a naive solution. By the way, uh, I don't see well. So if you have a query uh, and you raise your hand, I won't be able to see. So just shout out, hey, Manik, and stop, uh, interrupt me right there. Okay. So here's a naive solution that we might uh, propose. Right. Um, it's called click boosting, and actually, let me explain it with that. Uh, bad example again, right? So click boosting is the thing where you take your original baseline results, then you see which images were clicked, and then you just promote them to the top in sorted order. And everything else you keep the same as the original. Okay? So that solution is called click boosting. Okay? And here is what might happen with the result of that, right? So there are three problems with click boosting which I'll illustrate very quickly. The first is the images at the top have uh, this self-referential loop where they get entrenched. So people have this click behavior where they always click on the things that come first. Okay? So if you show these images, then these images at the top will keep getting more and more and more clicks, and then Jitendra will never be able to re replace me as a top computer vision scientist. Right? So that's one problem with click boosting. Things at the top tend to get entrenched. The second is you always have distractor images, and people will always click on them. Okay? So you ask any kind of query, you'll get an image of a beautiful girl, and people will click on her. Or the beautiful man. We have to be gender uh, equal over here. And actually, th this is one of the reasons why I'm working with this fake query. I, had I shown you what people really click on and what are real distractors, I would be in jail by now. <laughs> uh, and the third problem with this is you might have images that are at the bottom, but that are very similar to images at the top, and they'll continue to languish at the bottom. Right? They'll never really get promoted to the top because they've never been shown on the first page. They never have got any clicks. So that's the third major problem with click boosting. So what we're going to do is, it's a very simple solution, right? We're going to just predict the number of clicks for each of the images. And the argument is that, suppose on some normalized measure of similarity, this image, let's say, has a similarity with this of 0.5. Then you should say it should get half of that image's clicks. So if that had 1,000 clicks, you should get 500. Right? And if it's 0.25 with the second image, then it should get a quarter of those clicks here. And then you just add all the clicks up, and you find out how many images, how many clicks this should get, and then you boost that to the top. And that will go ahead and replace all the distractor images and the bad results. Okay? So that's the underlying, the very simple idea. Okay? So here's our Gaussian process regression formulation. What we're going to be doing is taking the top 1,000 results, out of these, there'll be some clicked images, like 10, 20, or 30 clicked images. From those clicked images, we learn a regression model to predict the weights for our re-ranker. So we learn those weights from that 30 images of th 30, that set of 30 clicked images. And then we'll use that to predict the number of clicks for all the other images. Right? And then we'll re-rank on the basis of that, the prediction of number of clicks and the original ranking score. Okay. So that's how we will do, uh, how we'll do the work. So let me just go into the details of the individual uh, bits of it. So the first thing is the re-ranking function. Yeah. OK, so you have the score from Bing. So uh, your ranker was just W transpose x. So you know what the score was, the ranking score was. So we're going to take the ranking score, and then we're going to take the number of predictions, the number of predicted clicks based on textual features and visual features. And I'll get to this in a minute. 
and then we're just going to do a linear combination of these and we'll get a new ranking score and sorting on the basis of this score is going to give us a new ranking so the original bing the original ranking score and then the predicted number of clicks and a linear combination so this is very simple straightforward okay now before i go and explain all the uh, components let me quickly tell you about our measure of uh, uh, how how we measure performance so in search the measure of performance is ndcg and that's like a really it's a big mouthful normalized discounted cumulative gain so why do i need to use this as compared to let's say classification accuracy for instance okay so the problem is if i use something like classification accuracy or cumulative gain right uh, that is insensitive to the order in which the images are ranked uh, are presented right so you want something and people will only tend to look at the top 2 3 results they don't really care about the 20th result that much so we want something that is sensitive to the ranking in which you present uh results okay so suppose you have a ranking algorithm it gives you a, a particular ranking r and you go and you label the ground truth so you say the first image is very relevant i'll give it a score of 5 in your ranking the second image is irrelevant i'll give it a score of 1 so this r is that ranked list with that 5 1 2 3 whatever in your thing right and then what you do is you compute cumulative gain at p which means because people tend to look at only the top 20 images or the top 40 images nobody 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 apart from us researchers ever goes to the second page or the 50th page right so you just want to calculate the score at the top p images so you calculate this at let's say p is equal to 20 okay so if you can compute a classification measure like cumulative gain then as i said it's it's insensitive to a permutation of the ranking right so what we do is we compute something called discounted cumulative gain where we divide by this log factor okay so you want to penalize things that are lower down on the list or, or, or you want if you if you get things wrong in the top you want to penalize them more so that's what this dividing by this log factor does so it's called dcg at p and this should be fine except for one problem which is you cannot compare the dcg of two different queries right so one query return only 10 results the other query return 15 results how do you compare their dcg values so in order to do that what you have to do is normalized by the dcg of the ideal rank list so somebody if they had access to ground truth could just go and put all the good perfect matches on the top that would give you the ideal rank list so you compute the dcg of the ideal rank list and just divide that by the dcg of your ranking algorithm that gives you this thing called ndcg normalized discounted cumulative gain and this is our measure of performance in search any questions about this why 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 are inverse log weight you could choose anything you could you could actually learn learn this so what you could do is you could go get a bunch of users ask them how important is this result how good is this result and you can learn out learn the factors over here you can do lots of stuff is it's what the community has agreed on to use as their metric anything else okay so we're going to use ndcg right now what are the main technical challenges that i'm going to face the main technical challenges come in terms of the features and the learning right so what happens is we have a bunch of features going into the algorithm like when we when we do ranking so we have lots of query independent features so these are like google's page rank how how, how well connected is this image to all the other images on the web etc right so you have query independent features when you have query dependent text features like the file match thing i was telling you does the query match the image file name or not and then you have a bunch of visual features so you have sift and hog and blah 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 right so you have this you, these combined about 1000 dimensions that's about 2000 dimensions okay so you have this 3000 dimensional feature vector and you have about 30 images from which you can train on okay so you immediately run into this massive problem of overfitting so how are we going to uh, tackle that uh, okay my, w- w- the 10 2200 images this is per query per query this is how many clicks you get yeah so on average so of course you have these queries which are called the head queries where they have lots and lots and lots of clicks but we are not interested in those we are interested in the images which have let's say on the order of between 10 and 20 clicks right or but that still seems very very little i mean this is this is what oh no so if you if you account for the total number of queries this this was asked this is more than 60% of all queries that are asked 60% of all queries that's running into i don't know what how many 60% of a billion i don't know in a month that's a huge staggering number the tail the tail in image search is very large right no no but what i what i mean is that it's i i see so there is there is just a huge amount of queries so even with this yeah huge uh, query it's still it's still you only get about 2200 yes yeah yeah in fact very little right i mean you can really influence results 
by just like querying five times a, a specific term and clicking something badly yeah. and then, then you do Yeah, the so, so if you, yeah, if you want, wanted to game the system, that would be possible. Unless other people were also doing that. Yeah. Uh, so where was I? Yeah, so we have about, uh, let's say, 20, 30 images to train on. And we have this 3,000 dimensional feature vector. How will we ever predict anything over here? Okay. So we went, um, the first thing is, OK, dimensionality reduction. You reduce the dimensionality of the problem, get it down to about 20 or 30 dimensions, and then you're in good shape. Now, the problem with that is most dimensionality reduction methods are discriminative. Okay. So if you take something like LDA or, 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 or stuff that really works well, that's all discriminative. But over here, our pro discriminative in the sense you need positive training data and you need negative training data. We only have positive training data. We know what was clicked in response to that query, but we have no idea what was irrelevant. Okay? So it's very difficult to apply discriminative methods. Um, because with discriminative methods, what you could do is you could also blow up the size of your training set. right? You say, OK, so I have only 30 clicked images. What happens if I could sample 30,000 negative clicked images? Right? If I could get that, that would be great. Okay? And then you can uh, go ahead and use a discriminative method for your feature selection. Now, there are some ways of getting negative, uh, negative uh, documents for your query. In fact, Andrew has tried one of them. One of them is simply, you know, you go to the end of your ranking, and you just pick documents from there at the bottom, right? So if, you have, if, you're, if, you're donkey, uh, if your rack, um, ranking has about 50,000 results, surely results 49,000 to 50,000 have to be bad. So take that as your set of irrelevant answers to the query. That turns out to be a really bad strategy for image search. There were queries where we found as many irrelevant images, sorry, relevant images on the 50th page as on the first page. Okay? So that's a strategy that doesn't work very well. In document search, they have another strategy which says, you know, we're going to present you results in a serial order. So, and, and, and they do eye tracking studies. They study how people look at the results. And so, Everybody scans this list linearly. So if you looked at the first, and you looked at the second, and you went and clicked on the third, people infer the first two were not as relevant as the third. Okay? So then they can use that to pick up their negative data. Again, strategies like that fail on image search. So you display things on a grid, and you have things that are nearby, and the, and, and the things that are later on tend to get clicked. Things that were earlier on don't get clicked, but they're equally relevant. So that doesn't work. And you could try all this, like in computer vision, we are very fascinated with text these days, right? Especially WordNet and MindNet and all that stuff. So you say, okay, I'll go, and I'll go to WordNet, I'll pick out the closest query I have on WordNet to my query, if it's a simple noun or something like that. And I'll get, from that query, I'll get all my negative training data. Turns out to be a very bad idea as well. Doesn't work all that well. Okay? So we tried lots of these techniques, none of that worked. We tried. ICML, best paper, dimensionality reduction techniques. We tried Rich Zemmel's work. He was the program chair at NIPS this year. None of that worked. What worked were very simple generative methods which work with just positive data. And the simpler it got, often the better results we had. Okay? So here's one way of doing features, uh, feature selection in this large space. What you could do is you could take each feature and just rank on the basis of that feature. Okay? So my file name feature, I have a ranker based just on that feature. Now I find out how what is the average rank of my clicked images? Because I assume clicked are correlated, so I want the clicked images at the top. I just go and, go and ask, how correlate, what is the average rank of these clicked images? And if the rank is high, I'll select the feature. If it's not, I'll drop the feature. So if you do something like that, that actually doesn't work that well. You get an NDCG, uh, which is the number between 0 and 1 and larger, is better, of about 62%. That's not that great. But then we tried lot, lots of different things. And surprisingly, PCA worked very well. So we got our best results with PCA. So what we're going to do is we're taking this 1,000 dimensional vector of page rank and text features, compressing that down to 20 dimensions. Then we're taking this 2,000 dimensional vector of visual features, shift, hog, color descriptors, et cetera, compressing that down to 20 dimensions as well. And now on these 20 dimensional vectors, we're going to go ahead and do our uh, prediction of clicks. Okay. How do we do the prediction of clicks? Uh, it's a very standard Gaussian process regression model. Uh, this is it, right? Um, there are many ways of posing the problem. You can pose click prediction as classification, as ordinal regression, as lots of different ways. Again, I'm not going to give you results on all the things we tried and didn't work. In the end, this, this is, regression is what worked pretty well. So don't worry too much about Gaussian process regression. The best way to think of it is, suppose you have your 30 clicked images. 
you build a vector with each image, with each component in the vector being the number of times that that image was clicked, right? So this image was clicked a thousand times, fifty times, two hundred times, etc. Okay. Then you find out from your what is the distance of your image that you want to re-rank with the image for which you have the number of clicks. So as I said, this image is similar to this image, a score of 0.5, so you have half, half of its clicks here, a quarter of its clicks here, blah, 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 and you just add all of those up. Okay? So it's as simple as that. It's exactly the intuition I gave you earlier. So that's what we're doing in Gaussian process regression. And uh, if you look at the results again, then uh, you can see that GPs perform the best. SVM regression doesn't perform well. I don't really understand that at this point of time. But that's the folklore, uh, that's the common wisdom in this community. For regression, use Gaussian processes. For classification, use SVMs. Linear regression, again, as we think, uh, as we thought, performs really badly. And that's, it's just because there's no way, peop the way people click is going to be correlated linearly with the way we, we, we build our features. That's just like, it's not going to happen. So you can kiss that goodbye. Okay. So here are some more results before I show you the actual uh, visual images, etc. If you just take the Bing baseline, you get about 68% NDCG. And now if you add this re-ranking based on just text features, you get a small improvement about 70%. And when you now add this visual feature component that none of the search engines have so far, then you can see we have a big jump in performance to about 76%. And these are like really, really, really significant in the, in the search domain. I see most NDCG improvements are in, in, in that order of magnitude. So why is it that if you just have the visual, you have a difference? Because visual features by themselves are not very good. I mean, just, it's, like, it's like doing SIFT, right? SIFT would never recognize you or AZ or, right? So, so you, you, you're using text to kind of narrow down the... the yeah, text the actually area. provides a very good signal mm -hmm. um, by and large. Yeah, but of course, visual features can help uh, boost performance on top of that. I don't think there is a substitute. You'll have to use both. Yeah. So what do the results actually look like? Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So just this one graph. This is how the, we do the analysis. So this is done on about 200 queries with a thousand images per query. So it's a fairly large scale experiment in terms of that. Uh, so if you have between 10 and 20 clicked images, then you get this really big, huge jump of about 12%. Uh, the results are still fairly significant when you have between 40 and 60 clicked images. But beyond that, the results tend to taper down. And that's, again, kind of, it makes sense. What we're really interested in is in the tail, in this segment. Over here, things tend to get much easier. The head queries are, in some sense, easier than tail queries. Okay? And here are the category-wise category analysis of where, where we make the largest improvement as compared to. I got a quick question. Yeah. Uh, so when you're using the visual features. Yeah. Yeah, no, I didn't. So I think what he's asking is, not only do we record what you clicked on, we know where you clicked on. So there is some uh, thinking that people actually don't just click randomly on an image, they click on the area that's important. It's kind of similar to an eye tracking study where you actually look. So I think what you're asking is, can you leverage information of where you clicked on in the image? Is that? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. The fact that both are red Apple kind of things rather than Apple logos is a very strong cue that you want to use. And so if people preferred real Apples over Apple logos, that would come out very strongly through the visual features, right? So that's exactly why we use visual features, yes. So uh, I'll show you a result of that uh, in a second, right? So, okay, how do we do, how, how do we really do visually? So, if you ask the query fracture in Bing, these are the results that you get. And uh, we've marked these images from the movie not as being incorrect, but not being as the perfect match, okay? So, that's why they have red rectangles around them. Otherwise, if you'd mark them as incorrect, our NDCG would be even higher. Uh, we'd have a much more sharp jump in NDCG. So, those were the Bing results. These are our results. As you can see, we're showing mainly images of broken bones. That image had disappeared off the web by the time we got to crawl it, so we don't know what happened there. And this image is just wrong, so that, that result is incorrect. Okay. Um, going about back to the user intent thing, right? Um, as I was saying, there's very, 
it doesn't make sense to me that somebody just sitting at the end of a thing looking at a query can decide what it is. You really have to study this problem in detail to figure out what people mean. So for example, when people ask the query Pacific Ocean, they don't really want random images of water, right? This image of water could be anywhere. It turns out when people are asking for things like Pacific Ocean, what they really want to do is figure out where it is on the map. They want to, or, or they want to see an aerial image of it. When people are asking location queries like Delhi or Bern or New York, they don't want, like for Bangalore, you could take an image of this room and put it up, right? And some people will say that's a valid result. That's not why people are asking for images of Bangalore. What they want are, what are the tourist landmarks? What are, what are the monuments? What should I go and visit? That's what people want to see, okay? And I don't think people can just, like, judges can get that straight away just by looking at the query. Okay. So here are uh, results for Pacific Ocean. As you can see, we've marked these images of water as being not very relevant, even though the supporting web page said there is still Pacific Ocean. And when we do the re-ranking, we mainly have maps and aerial images. Um, NATs, these two images are wrong in Bing. Again, mainly because of the text, I think. Uh, when we go and re-rank them, we get that completely right. So again, the reason I'm focusing on the top 20 is because that's what most people look at. Very few people go to the second page, again, less than 5%. Oh, wait, Malik, so, so yeah. these, these uh, resulting queries, this is something that, these, are, these queries you did not train on? Yes? No, I train on these queries because what I'm doing is I'm training something per query. So you ask the query uh, camel caravan, I go and see what people clicked on for this query. On the fly, I train a re-ranker on those 30 clicked images. And then I go and re-rank everything else on that query based on what I just learned. It's only for this query? Yeah, only for this query. Because then the baseline algorithm would also look pretty good, right? Which is basically just <coughs> get rid of, you know, ring down the stuff that's wrong. The, which one? Just the, your baseline the, algorithm, the, which is just... Not the, cl uh, the, the Bing baseline, what we have uh, in... The, or the click boost? They just use the, use the, so you, wait, no, I'm, oh, I see, so you have positive, you have positive click data, right? Yeah. So, so you, remember the, the baseline algorithm was to just bring, bring the, the things that people click on. Click onto the top. Front. Yeah, so naive click boosting, right? Right, so yeah. how does this? So in terms of NDCG, I think click boosting gets a performance of about like 72%. So it, that's a qualitative, uh, quantitative number. We get 76, uh, 77. Uh, but the dangers with click boosting are long term, right? If you have the same image at that spot all the time, then you're going to do really badly. Uh, it's just going to get entrenched over there. And people, when a new new thing comes in, like tomorrow something happens to, well, not to Michael Jackson anymore, but uh, you, you get a prize, right? <laughs> you don't have the image of you here now, whatever, or Aaron getting the prize. No, it's aggregated across people. So we look at logs going back for the last six months, asked who all clicked the query, uh, asked this query and see what they clicked on. If I wanted to personalize it to your taste, I would have very sparse data. So for instance, let's say all of us have asked this query before, but you, you've never asked the query. This is the first time you're going to ask. Okay, so I won't be able to leverage the other data. Now I can do things in machine learning called collaborative filtering, where I kind of figure out how similar you are to me, Alyosha, AZ, etc., and then based on our clicks, try and predict something for you. So that's something we want to look at going into the future. But Did it's a you find queries like happen yeah, these are real-world queries sampled from a query log. This is our competitive set. This is what Bing really wants to nail. These are not queries I dreamt up. And the queries, so that's why, that's why I'm stressing this, right? In computer vision, we've been focusing on nouns most of the time, right? Like if you look at the Caltech categories or whatever. And, and the categories that we find, the queries that we find in our, in our logs, they are so different from, from what we, we've been working on to train our thing. It would be very difficult to get training data for a lot of these queries. I don't even know what these queries mean. So look at this. Uh, oh, so okay, here's Camel Caravan. That's the original. That's what we get, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, 24 inch rims. Somebody comes and gives you a query like this, would you even know what to do? I had no clue. I thought I was a fairly competent guy, right? I have no idea what 24 inch rims are, how to even score this query. Then you go and see what people are clicking on, and then you see, see the underlying web page. It turns out 24 inch rims refers to oversized tires. So in, in the US where they have these really huge hulking tires on which, on, on which your car sits, that's what 24 inch rims means. 
And any expert trying to get that would, I, I don't know what he would do. Okay. So again, here are the Bing baseline. Uh, you can see like these images are not of cars sitting on the top. This image, you can't tell just by looking at the image, so you have to go to the web page behind the image and then you realize it's not really talking about 24 inch rims at all. So that's why we marked that as incorrect. When you look at our results, uh, it's all cleaned up. One of the slight worries that I have about our method is that we are reducing diversity in some sense. Okay? So if you have a, uh, so one of the valid criticisms is if you go and just apply your method now because you're bringing things that are visually similar, you'll just end up with lots of duplicates. Okay? So that can be a problem, but that can also not be in a problem. <clears throat> we can actually do better than that. Right? So here is the query Stargate 1994. It's a, it's, a, it's a film or a TV series, I think, from 1994. And these are the baseline results. And you can see that there are a lot of duplicates in this, in the, in the original ranking. Now, because people are clicking on different kinds of things, when we do the re-ranking using our method, you see you get a much richer visual experience. Because people aren't just clicking on images of duplicates all the time, you, 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 we, we get a much more diverse set of results. So yes, while at one level, if you have two modes, one is very dominant as the other. So in fracture, you have 98% broken bones, 2% um, uh, movies. Then we'll get rid of the 2%. Okay? Uh, but in other cases, when you have equal modes, when you have three different types of clicked images, all of them are like about 33% or 30, 30, 40%, then you'll get a good distribution. So one of the things we want to do going, in, going, going forward is see if you can cluster based on user intent, if you can somehow divine that cluster based on that, and then show results based on those clusterings. So you just show results from one cluster at the top, and then the other cluster, and then the other cluster. OK, so that is more or less, I think I'm out of time. So that's my talk. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge some people, both at Yahoo. Uh, so there's Deepak Agarwal at Yahoo, who I'd like to thank some folks at UMass, James Allen, and then uh, some folks at Microsoft, Mark Bolin, Chief Hacker. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to take questions. Sorry, I'm just trying to get a handle on the time. Yeah. Any? Sure. Yeah. What do you mean by context? Uh, what, what are you referring to by context? Uh, there is something like, uh, something like rows. I mean, uh, uh, something like events or rows or uh, flowers with uh, rows. Um, yes. Are you, are you talking about queries with different intents? or I, I, I don't know what you mean by context. Oh, you mean you have a specific interpretation of rows in mind? No, I, I'm interested in uh, uh, details about all the flowers of rows. Yeah, or, yeah flowers of rows. OK. I, uh, rows. I see. I think I don't really understand your question. Maybe we should take it offline, because I, I don't think I understand what you're saying, what the real question is. Right. Yeah. So my one way of improving image search results would be that you can just keep suggesting to the person that whatever he's typing can be appended with something else, right? Yeah. Stargate the movie or, you know, yeah. the movie. And if, if that list appears, and yeah. you can just prompt the user. Right. Uh, That's a great suggestion. Yeah. Like a Wikipedia desertification. Did you mean oh, AC no, the no, movie no. or AC the research? OK. So that doesn't work. You see, um, there's a lot of work on, 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 on this uh, pseudo relevance feedback. <clears throat> So if you look, go to these uh, IR communities, right? C uh, CIVR, et cetera. So people say, you know, if you could just click on one image and tell us this is relevant and give us more of this, then you know we can do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know how many people actually click on, give you that one single click? Less than 2% of all users on the internet will click even once on an image uh, to, do, to, to give you feedback. They'll click to look and do their own thing. They won't click to give you feedback. So. There's an expectation. Everything must happen automatically. Wait, 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 wait. wait this, is, this is, how did they test this? Uh, we have logs. We can there test. No, no, it's, a, it's on real world data. We but know. But there's, there's no application as far as I know. Oh, as both Google and us have more like this. Huh? 
uh, find similar, oh, more oh, like this. Sim oh, right, 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 right. So, right. so we know we know exactly how many people do that. It's it's ridiculous. Nobody will give feedback. But even if they, they provide you that one one click, hmm. one image click, how much does it help? It can help a lot. It would help disambiguate, right? It would tell you like if you have these three different intents, I want more from this cluster rather than those two clusters. I want images from from uh, 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 of maps of the Pacific Ocean. I want to know where it is on a map. Like the night train example. Yeah. So, so suppose they clicked on the motorcycle. Yeah. So you know they want more images of the motorcycle, right? Right. Right. So how would you see that back then? Would you now have a new category? Would you then? No. So I know what you clicked on. I know both what the document looks like as well as what the image looked like that you're interested in. So I can do a visual similarity search, or I can do a textual similarity search. Just bring in more images that look like this image. I could do that, right? So that's already a product feature, both at Google and, and, and Bing. Uh, of course, we did that first. With time? Yeah. So if you, you'd have to retrain this every night. Uh, and, and that's exactly the beauty of it. Okay. So here's another problem. Queries are very time sensitive. Something happens to somebody famous tomorrow like, uh, or today, within five minutes, you need to start changing your result set to reflect that event. Queries change with season. So Christmas queries are very different from uh, summer queries. Right? If you can train on the fly, if you could do this on the fly, uh, then the problem simply goes away. Right? This is slightly difficult to train on the fly because of certain uh, ways the architecture is built. But what you could do is you could do a you could do this offline. There's, there's a way of like, actually, instead of doing it on the fly when a query comes in, you could do some kind of pre-computation to get this to work. So if you can run this training every night, you're still fine. You need to normalize the clicks. You need to normalize the clicks, yes. That's a big thing. Yeah. When you say do it every night, you mean somebody goes and you... Sorry? This requires user interface, right? Mm, uh, what? No, no. So we, we already have the Bing thing, right? You go type in your query. We know what is also shown. We know what was clicked. All that is gets logged automatically. So you just need a big, massive, huge server farm that will go and crunch the log and compute this and store this and feed it back to you next day. Sorry? Uh, yeah, I haven't thought of the adversarial scenario at all. So as Alyosha said, you could screw this up by just like getting in. But you would be screwing it up. Yeah, you would. Uh, I haven't thought about the adversarial scenario. So this is really eye-opening that, that, that you get so little data for a query. Um, well, for, we, yeah. we looked at either somehow clustering similar queries and, and, and you know, sharing clicks across them? Yeah, so what people have done in the past is build this click graph, so a bipartite graph. You have queries on this side, and uh, all the images that were clicked on that side. Now you do a random walk on this graph, you can figure out how similar is one query to another based on clicks. You can try and leverage that information. So uh, people have done this in the past. There's a SIGIR paper by some people at Microsoft on that. But we are doing a slightly better job. Now, can we do even better by bringing in things? So at the moment, we have this problem, right? You ask camel or you ask camels, there are two different queries. And in one, the click data might be sparse, and the other, it might not be. So like this kind of aggregation will help. It also gets you into trouble, because query classification and query similarity is actually very hard. At the moment, they do have verticals. So if you're in the health system or the entertainment, in, in these regimes, there's a classifier that comes in and automatically classifies your query. And you go and learn different rankers for these regimes, because they're very different. But uh, that's actually a very hard problem. Uh, it's not easy. Any other questions? Okay, let's then. Cool. And uh, I was told to uh, present you with this oh, uh, gift, thanks. which uh, I'm, I'm apparently is uh, the script for a soon-to-be-released movie, AZ the movie. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Alicia.